Well, Hope Church, it's great to be with you. Please open up to the book of Judges. We find ourselves in chapter 6 tonight, and uh, it took us a little over 70 minutes to get through two chapters last week, and tonight we have three chapters to go, and this is one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, so buckle up, shot of caffeine, I trust you're all uh, ready to go. In the book of Judges, we are met with Israel as they have recently, in as far as the books go, but, but it's, it's, it's arcing up over, you know, a, a hundred years or more now that they've been in the land of Israel that was promised to their forefather, patriarch Abraham. They have now become tribes and a large nation in Egypt. They were enslaved. God rescued them uh, graciously and majestically and miraculously. Uh, Joshua, under Joshua's leadership, they made a good start to uh, 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 their entry into the land and casting out the, the, the uh, pagan nations and their pagan gods. Uh, they, they started well, but by the time we get to Judges, we now have failure after failure after failure, that all of the uh, tribes did disseminate and they did sort of go to their own allotted tribal areas that God had prophesied for them and over them. They went to their areas, but so few, in fact, if any, were faithful to actually drive out the original inhabitants. They were faith, they were uh, failures at that task. And so we see constantly that this is not just a geopolitical uh, failure to, to sort of uh, uh, fulfill the map prophecy. It's not simply that they, they, uh, uh, the, the, they're not living on the right lots of land. Their suburb and their postcodes are slightly edited and God's going to have to, uh, you know, uh, re redress some of the letters he's going to send to them through the prophets. It's not that. It is that by their faithlessness in God, they failed to drive out the original inhabitants. By their failure to drive out the inhabitants with their false gods, their false worship, their false priests and their kings, in failing to do that, they showed God positively and undoubtedly that they did not believe his promise to be with them in the battle and they did not value, they did not prioritize obedience to his commands which just at the end of the book of Joshua, right before Judges, they promised on pain of their own life that they would prioritize and value. So they are here in a, and we need to read uh, this book always covenantally. We read Judges through the lens of Deuteronomy because at the end of Deuteronomy, God told them how to live in the land and what would happen if they failure, failed to obey his commands in the land. So we read this whole book through the lens of covenant, realizing they are not, uh, uh, the Bible does not present to us in the Old Testament history, New Testament history, or all of church and world history, we must not believe in a deistic God. That is a God that is creator, and at the end he'll come back and he'll set some things straight. And he was there a couple of times. There were some miraculous moments, and Jesus sure was a great highlight. But ultimately, in your life and my life, as far as what we do Monday through Saturday, and basically most of world history, God is sitting back, he's relaxing, and he's watching world history unfold much like a... A boomer father is watching the nightly news. He's just, he's just interested. He's learning what's going on. He's, he's, he's uh, 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 taking notes at what is going on in our life that we are enacting. No. This book reminds us that on every stage of, Australia, of history's page, I'm just quoting the national anthem there uh, to make it applicable to us, I guess, uh, in every moment of Australia's history, in every moment of the church's history, in every moment of America, Russia, Afghanistan, everybody's history is all written by God and is intricately being sustained by God for his ultimate purposes, which often don't make the history books and often don't make the scripture because it's closed. It is simply God's working in your life and in my life. That's what the book of Judges reminds us. Everything is spiritual because everything is done under God's eyes. Everything is that looks very political in Gideon's day is in fact deeply spiritual. So let's look at uh, 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 Judges chapter 6. We learn this, that the lefties are in charge. Idolatry is widespread. The people are killing their own children in abortion. And uh, this is because of God's judgment on them. Gideon, uh, Gideon's story uh, starts here in Judges chapter 6. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. That is seven long hard years. Again, this is the relationship. This is the process of the book of Judges. 
Last week, Deborah and Barak uh, and Jael, we love Jael with the tenth peg to the head of old Sisera. Uh, they delivered by God's mighty hand uh, the nation of Israel. And they had some peace for 40 years, it says at the end of chapter 5. But again, Israel did what was evil. And so the Lord gave them into the hand of the Midianites. It looked political. It just looked like they moved in, uh, they crossed the borders, they established their idolatrous worship. Uh, the Israelite way of life was sort of sidelined. They were mostly pushed to the side and replaced. But, but it's just political. No, Judges is reminding us. This is deeply deeply spiritual because different demon gods are now ruling over people in God's promised holy land. <clears throat> in verses 2 through 6, we see what happened uh, specifically at the hands of the Midians. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountain and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the, Midian, the Midianites and the Amalekites would come against them. They would encamp uh, against them and devour the produce of their land all the way down as far as Gaza. So Midian was originally very far down south, uh, uh, down um, even uh, east of the, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba. So, um, further, you know, even further south as far as latitude goes than Egypt. But they were nomadic. So they would travel around uh, on camels and they were uh, warfaring people. And so they came up uh, uh, to, uh, probably through the northeast, uh, 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 on the east side of the Jordan, and then entered Israel there. And basically what would happen is that cro at crop time, at harvest time, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would jump the border. They would come on their uh, loyal steeds, the camels, and they would uh, come down like locusts, the text tells us, and they would just steal all of the agricultural crops crop and all of the wheat and all of the bread and all of the flour and all of the oil and all of the wine and they would move down just leaving uh, the text says Israelite as a Israel as a wilderness behind them they would come in like crop eating locusts take everything go back home and leave Israel with nothing they're in this horrible economical depression and they're living in caves and dens verse three uh, verse two tells us so they are afraid of, and they cannot live in the land that God has given to them. So they're living in caves and in dens. This is basically the equivalent of living in, in rabbit holes and bomb shelters and run down uh, caravans in the, in the side of the mountains. Don't, don't, don't walk out during the day, only travel at night, not with any bright torches, keep yourselves hidden. They are, they are uh, uh, hiding in their own nation just as God told them they would be. See, in Deuteronomy 28, God told them that if they disobey him and if they forget the covenant, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will go out one way against them, but you will run away in seven ways before them. You shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. And you shall grope around at noonday as the blind man gropes in darkness. And you shall not prosper in your ways, and you shall be only oppressed and robbed continually, and there shall be no one to help you. So this is, what they, this is basically the, the introduction, the setting, the state of Israel. Uh, uh, anyone who wanted to farm their crop had to do it secretly. Instead of doing it up on a uh, big hill where the breeze would be coming over the hill, which is where they would grind down their, uh, their, their crop to, to remove the husk, and the breeze would sort of blow away all of the uh, uh, inedible husk of the, of the crop so that they would left, be left behind with that flour that they, uh, sorry, the, the, those, those, uh, those, those grains that they would then be able to grind to make flour and bread and whatnot. Uh, uh, instead of doing it out in the open, as their fathers had taught them how to do, they were now grinding flour and, and grinding grain down in the basement, basically, in the wine cellar, we're told. And precisely at this low point of Israel, their failure, their sin, their idolatry had gotten, to, gotten them to a place of subjugation, of slavery, of robbery, and of loss, and uh, national destruction. Right at this point, we are introduced uh, to uh, a prophet. The, the people called out, uh, to God, it says in verse 6, they were brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to 
Yahweh. Now, here is what they wanted. They wanted a solution. They wanted a solve, uh, a, a, basic, a, 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 a solving a situation to their bad situation. They wanted somebody to come in, as they've heard from the past, Deborah, whoever it might be, somebody come in, uh, grab an ox goad or maybe a jaw of a donkey, something. Othniel had some great work. Just kill everybody. Get us back to our economical riches, our flourishing, our living in the promises. Please, God, amen. Signed, Israel. They wanted a cheap solution. They wanted out of their economy. And look at what God sends them in verse 7. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. (laughs) When you think about it, that's not what they wanted at all. They wanted solution because of their terrible situation. And instead, God raises up a preacher who preaches way too long and tells them what they don't want to hear and tells them it's all their fault. They want a way out of this, and God sends them a prophet to say, remember, you suck. Just just so you know whose fault this is. You are here because you have forgotten God's grace by which he led you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You are here because of your sin and your breaking of the covenant. Thus says the Lord, said the prophet, the God of Israel, I led you up out of Egypt. I brought you out of the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you, and I drove them out. Before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. And then he went home. It's a real dire, damning kind of negative sermon. See, this is why in God's uh, economy of running the world, he ordains that there are politicians or governors or kings and they have their place. They organize, they protect, they lead. But God has also ordained the church to be preachers. That is why we need politicians. We also need preachers to remind everybody why the politicians suck. We have politicians who come in and say, here's how we're going to fix this area of the economy. Here's what we might do to reinvigorate our education system. It's the preacher and the prophet who gets up and says, thus says the Lord, we keep sinning. We hate Jesus. We kill our children. We deserve this and worse. The politician might be used in God's ordination, and he is, and all politicians and government are there by God's plan, and they may help in enacting some of the the, the plans, but the why, the theology, the how we got here, the sin, that's the job of the church. And we need both. Church doesn't vie for the power of the political office, but goodness me, doesn't the political office always try and steal the pulpit? Define what love is. Define how to love our neighbor, how to treat people, what's righteous, and just how tolerant God is. This is why the world needs preachers. So God sends a preacher and a prophet to remind them this isn't just political. This is not just military. This is spiritual. This is theological. Look at who you're worshiping. You are worshiping, and so could be said over the West today, you are worshiping gods that hate you. Are you surprised that the gods are destroying you? Moloch and Baal and these other uh, horrible pagan gods are alive and well today. I hope I'm not, uh, not surprising anybody, though I'm sure I am, to say that when the old world used to worship their, their gods, it was no different to what our world does today, even if your friend tells you they're an atheist. They would invest in things to try and get a good agricultural uh, uh, return. So, our, so people in our age do the same. They would spend their free time simply uh, giving their life and their time and to be entertained by uh, false religious uh, systems and entertainment. So people do today. People would uh, uh, name their kids after certain gods. So people do today. People will uh, act in sort of sexual ways in order to please and get the attention of gods. So people do today. We have all different types of labels for them. Oh no, it's, it's, it's self-help or it's just my, my political government office that I'm voting for. That's who my hope lies in. Or it might be a, a, a star signs, goodness me. Or it may be a, a, a other actual religions today. Uh, it may be a, kinds of a, 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 a items or degrees or jobs or career. You, you, na- you, you, fi- you call it what you will and different names are thrown all over it. Demons don't die. And they're the same demons, the same demons that used to, uh, I guess, stand on this earth and be on this lot of ground in Australia and be worshipped by pagan indigenous religions are still being worshipped today. They're just happy to receive it in whatever way Australians will give it today. Oh, it's gambling. Oh, it's uh, 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 alcohol. 
These things are all just, it looks political, it looks sociographical, it looks anthropological, it looks, looks statistical, whatever. It's spiritual. It's deeply spiritual. And so God sends the prophet to remind them, you are bowing down to demons who hate you. Stop being surprised when they act like they hate you. That's what the prophet does. And the uh, 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 shadow of the prophet comes the angel of the Lord. Look at verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat underneath the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was declaring the lordship of Yahweh, worshiping God in truth on the mountaintop and preaching the Torah. Right? No. No, he's doing his chores in a cave like all the other cowards. While his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide from the Midianites. He'd taken his wheat, he'd found a small little dank hole that they were meant to store wine, and he starts grinding at it with no wind. He's just got a manual fan to try and br- separate the chaff. and the, his, his bread would have, would have the chaff all through it. It's, it's terrible. It's, 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 a, it's a horrible state of the world when the bread is uh, not cooked well. Mark that. So here they are, here's uh, uh, Gideon acting the coward, verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, Yahweh is with you, O mighty man of valor. And you read that, and it, to me, it sounds very sarcastic, ironic, and hilarious. The angel of the Lord, which is very likely Jesus before he came uh, as a human Jesus, he would turn up every now and then as the angel of the Lord, the the chief and the ark messenger of God. And here he is, the angel of the Lord, and he's looking at, uh, you know, I don't know whether he had to duck down to come into this little cowardly hideout uh, bunker uh, where he's storing his wine and his chaffy bread, but he tells him, Gideon, the Lord is with you, oh, mighty man of valor. And we're introduced at this moment to uh, uh, Gideon as a man with faith, but which is continually doubting and weak. He has faith. He trusts God. He is continually doubting, and he is continually weak in that faith. For example, right now, it wasn't sarcasm. The angel of the Lord was not calling him, O Gideon, right? Notice the order. He doesn't say, O man of valor, the Lord will be with you. He doesn't say, O man of valor, for your valor, your manliness, your strength, now God will be with you. It's the opposite order because it has to be the opposite order. He says, the Lord is with you. Full stop. That's a promise. The angel of the Lord just declared it. Believe it. Therefore, I can call you a man of valor. Because you are weak, you're pathetic, you're hiding, you're in a tiny little cave, and as Gideon is about to remind the angel, he's from a small clan, and he's the youngest guy in his father's family. So he's the the runt of a small tribe in loser Israel, hiding in a cave. And God can still say, but if you have God on your side, you're the majority, you can be a man of valor. So, So he announces to him a promise, and Gideon doesn't receive it that way. Gideon actually twofold questions it. First of all, we see in verse um, uh, 13, Gideon, for a little guy, he's got some spine. He says back to the angel, well, you know, Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Oh, here we go. Okay. Well, first of all, Gideon, didn't you listen to the preacher who told you all of this has happened to you, though he's a mighty God who loves you and promised to be with you? He's done all of this because your dad, Joash, has a Baal altar in your backyard. And you haven't had the spine to go and burn it down. You're the problem, Gideon. That was the application of this preacher from chapter 1's sermon. You're the problem. Repent. Stop blaming God. Gideon still hasn't learned that lesson personally yet. He thought of his neighbors, like you and I do, right? He thought of his friend who really needed to hear that sermon. He, He copied the YouTube link so that he could send it to a friend who should really listen to this sermon. It's your fault. You're idolatrous. You're the problem. But he himself didn't take it to heart. And the angel of the Lord comes and says, here's your sermon application, which you haven't been listening to. It's your fault. So he says, well, if God's with us, why is all this happening? This doesn't make it. We're God's chosen people. Shouldn't we have unanimous victory and blessedness and thriving and flourishing? 
But now the Lord has forsaken us, he says in verse 13. Now the Lord has forsaken us. Uh, 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 did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? So what has happened? He's, he's very confused. But also down in uh, uh, verse 15, he makes another excuse saying, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. He's brought two excuses which shouldn't matter, both of them doubting what the angel first said. The Lord is with you. You are therefore, in his eyes, in this sake, because he is with you and clothing you, you are therefore a man of valor. And he says, not sure I'm a man of valor, I'm pretty small, and also I'm not sure God's with me. So yes, he's he's receiving the word, but he's receiving it with doubt, and that will become a theme of Gideon's life, is his faith that is tainted with doubt. Okay, the next part sort of happens if we skip from there up to the the, the last, uh, uh, around verse 19 onwards down to about verse 24. Here's what happens. Uh, He um, asks the angel of the Lord to stay so that he can show that he is faithful, that he believes, and that he's he's a good Israelite, basically. So he goes and he makes a meal for the angel of the Lord, and he brings it to the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord does a... What, if you and I saw it, would look like an act of wizardry, a kind of a David Copperfield sort of show. Uh, The angel of the Lord standing before him waits for him to cook. He brings the meal, puts it on a stone, and the angel touches it with his staff. Fire comes up from the stone and engulfs the meal, and the angel disappears in a cloud of smoke. And at that point, Gideon realizes, I was just talking to the angel of the Lord. That was God who was shown before. That's the one I was back chatting And so he says, woe is me, I'm about to die. This is how I die, back-talking God. And God's voice comes from heaven, sort of on the way, I guess on the way back up to heaven. He goes, no, 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 don't worry, I won't kill you. And he builds an altar then and says, thankfully, the Lord is peace and I don't have to die. So now he's getting a little bit more faith, but the doubt remains. God commanded him that night, so he's had quite a day, Verse 25 in chapter 6 says that as he was going to bed, basically, the Lord said to him that night, (laughs) God, this is great, God sanctions and ordains uh, religious terrorism, I guess. God says, go and get your father's second bull. So um, I don't know why. There's no exegetical reason I've seen why there's not the first bull, but the second bull. Maybe it's like, don't touch your dad's drive around car, go get the old ute that he's got sitting at the back of the shed, uh, hook it up, fill it with some diesel. So basically, go get the the dodgy, rusty pickup truck and uh, drive into town and where they've got the monument to Satan, right, Uh, the the LGBT monument or the the Baal monument and the Asherah monument, the Asherah monument was a big pole that was meant to look like a male uh, organ and that was Asherah. She was a lady demon. Uh, or she presented herself as a lady demon, but demons are male, so obviously this is that trans stuff coming through the demonic realm. Uh, the male demon presents femalely and puts up a big statue of a male organ, and the people would come and worship at it. So looking very uh, uh, valley on a Saturday night kind of sexual uh, uh, parties. And then the other altar and building was Baal, and he was the god of fertility. So um, this is how you get rich quick. You come and throw your money into the Baal slots and pull the, uh, the lever. And if uh, you, it, it turns out with three of the equal signs, you get all of your tokens. Am I also describing the valley on a Saturday night? This is gambling. Give a sacrifice of a kind, uh, almost bankrupt your family, and maybe you'll win big as the demon blesses you because God's path of covenant obedience and slow progression of faithfulness is not fun. Come and party this way. So you've got strippers on a pole, you've got gambling, looks like Brisbane, it's ancient Israel under God's curse, and you've got an altar there that these gods would be worshipped at. And basically, Gideon is told by God, go down, back the ute up, uh, put a big chain around it all, drive off and pull it down, and then grab the huge uh, pole and chop it up and burn it and make an altar to God and worship God there in that very moment and uh, 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 to God. So he does that. Look at the end of verse, uh, 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 look at verse 27. So God took 10 men, uh, sorry, Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. This is where we see Gideon's faithfulness. Did God tell him when he had to do it? No, no, not at all. Did he do it with fear? Yes. But did he do it? Yes, he did. I like the way that Gideon did it afraid way better than all the men who didn't do it didn't do it. 
If we look at him and say, what a coward, what a fool, if only he were more like us. Yeah, do you wear the purple badge? Do you wear the rainbow lanyard? Do you celebrate in the idols of the day? Are you the bold man that you expect Gideon to be? We ought to be. Nonetheless, the point is, don't be too harsh on him. He did the job. He went and he pulled down the altar and he disregarded. This is the dangerous work. This is spiritual. It says that he's afraid of the men in his family and the guys of the town. If he was seeing with his spiritual eyes, he would have been afraid of the demons that were going to mark him out. And if that's not enough, the next morning when the men finally wake up from their uh, uh, booze-filled sleeping and their late-night gambling at the uh, altar of uh, 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 the Baal Casino and the strip club, they sort of come out and their favorite places of worship, the casino and the strip joint, are burned down. They get angry and they start asking, who did this? And it's found out that it's Gideon. So they get on their uh, 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 scooters, their e-scooters, and they drive over to uh, Gideon's house and they, they say, we're going to kill him. Joash, bring out your son. It's time for him to die. And Joash, I don't know where sleepy Joash was before this, but he comes out with a very good response. He goes, really? You've come to fight for Baal. You've come to save your God. How about if my son has offended him, let Baal war with my son? Man. I don't know how Gideon felt about that. <laughs> I don't know whether he's sitting up the, in, the, in, in, the, in the roof of his uh, uh, house. Dad, sh- stop. Stop calling demons to attack me. I'm very much afraid at this moment. Nonetheless, uh, Joash shows some strength and says, and very rightly and very acutely and very theologically sound, my son has warred with a god, then bring the god to war with my son. And so his nickname becomes, Gideon's fighting name becomes Jurabbaal which means let Baal contend with him. That's a good name to have on a badge. That looks very good as you're marching down to the ring to have across the big LED LED screens. Let Baal contend against him, verse 32 says. So regardless, we're sort of at this point where where, um, uh, the tolerance of the Israelites, which has plagued Israel and been the cause of their downfall, tolerating and coexisting diversity, equity, inclusion with multiple gods. Uh, the great thing about all other gods except Jesus is they're all very tolerant. There's one that will tell its people to chop your heads off. But other than them, mostly other religions are very tolerant. You know, they're very inclusive. They don't mind that you worship other gods. And they will welcome uh, the coexisting of multiple religions. We're all going to the same heaven. And and, and you're the bigot because it's only Jesus that says, actually, no. If you don't worship the Son, you hate the Father. That's what Jesus said. Uh, God, Yahweh, Old Testament, New Testament, is the God, is the only one true living God. And he cares the most about exclusivity in his relationship. He will not do with the other gods, even though the other gods were happy to have Yahweh on the list. But Yahweh refused to have Baal and Asherah, so he told him to cut them down. At this point, we have uh, Gideon strengthened. His weakness is showing in full high death. All of his fears are coming to the surface. Yet, yet his faith does remain. And while his uh, uh, doubt is evident, his faith is also, I would say, even more evident. And this gives us an encouragement because in the last part of chapter 6 and verse 36 onwards, Gideon, again, goes to God and asks for basically a double-barrel miracle. God, overnight, let the Jew wet wet this this woolly jacket, but then not the ground. And then the next night he says, actually, God, make make the ground wet with dew and the woolly jacket not wet. Then I'll know it's a miracle. Apparently the angel just appearing to him, just just to put out some comment, apparently the fiery angel that disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Not quite enough. He, want, he wants a wet pile of wool. We don't understand, well, I don't want to get into the psychology or the mindset of Gideon. But what we know is this. He is, has faith in God, but he has this, this cowardice streak. He has, he has a sprinkles of doubt that is tainting his service. And I wonder if you can look with me and just say, amen. Amen, Gideon. I'm glad that there's somebody that is a bit more like me in the story. Who I would love, if, if, if I could tell all my stories of the past, they, I'd be a hero. If God honestly wrote the stories of the past, there would be streaks of faith and piles of doubt. I wonder if that's honestly the same with you. If we can look at Gideon and be thankful that 2 Corinthians chapter 12, which was written, written so many millennia later, still held true for him then. That God's strength is shown all the more when he's using weak 
vessels. For 2 Corinthians 12 says, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. See, just about anybody, myself included, and I cannot play any piano, just about anybody can walk up to one of those U-Butte computer-installed uh, uh, p- uh, pianos, a brand new from the shop, and maybe hit a couple of buttons, and then just sit there and pretending that I'm playing, and I could play Bach. I don't know what, what, uh, uh, what, what is before me on the sheet music, but that's what might come out of the speakers. Anybody can do that. It takes a master. It takes an absolute master to come and find an old dust box of a piano from the back storage room of an old church and play a beautiful tune. And that's how we see God using Gideon in all of his doubt, in all of his weakness, in all of his cowardice, in his, his frailty, and his failures, yet God able to redeem and glorify himself and save Israel and redeem the people through such an unworthy servant, a doubt-filled servant as Gideon, shows that he really is the master player. He's not working with an angelic man who with super strength and perfect morals. He's working with Gideon who is like you and I, weak often doubting, unsure of himself, and even more unsure of God. But that is the way that God works in this world. In chapter 7, we see that God uh, brings to Gideon, as Gideon marches around, blows the trumpet, calls people to battle because the Amalekites have joined the Midianites and they're going to come, come down and, and start stealing from uh, uh, Israel again. Gideon marches around, musters an army, and there is 32,000 men, uh, verse 3 hints at, there is 32,000 men that have mustered to that call. Now that sounds impressive. The bad news, the bad guys have over 150,000 men with a whole bunch of camels. Bad news. And to make it even worse, God wants to make Gideon even lower. So it's not just his own natural inclinations, his doubt with his faith, his own sins and his cowardice. It's not just that that makes him a a small instrument that we look at and say, well, God must be wonderfully powerful and sovereign if he can use Gideon for such a victory. But now God is also going to take this 32,000 person army that Gideon was able to muster and good on him. And he's going to turn it into a small small to medium sized church. He's going to take this 32,000 group and whittle it all the way down to 300 men so that it is Gideon that is small and unimpressive and it is his army that is small and unimpressive so that the only cause of salvation can be God. Look at verse 2. God says to Gideon, the people with you are too many to give the Midianites into their hand. Lest Israel boast over me, saying my own hand has saved me. And so he leads them uh, through this very uh, technical, they have to fill out all of this paperwork, this very long procedure. Here's what God does. Basically, Gideon announces, I wonder how confident he was going into this. Like, Everybody's going to stay. I've mustered them. I gave a pretty thrilling speech. They believe in me. I'm a, good, I'm, a, I'm a good rallier of men and a vision caster. And he just stands up and says, God says, if you want to go home, you can. And 22,000 men go, that's that great. I did not want to come. My wife really rushed me out of the house. She, uh, 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 you know, she said she was going to hold it against me if I didn't come. If, I don't know, if God said I don't have to go, I'm gone. I'm going home. It's a lot. And so 22,000 men marched off in front of Gideon. His, in, his, his, his confidence just marched out of the valley and went home. But his strength was still with him. His confidence seemed to have been leaning on the men, but God was saying, I and I alone am your strength. And then he does another uh, weird uh, category. He says, tell them to go down and drink at the water. Anybody who picks up water and drinks it, with making a cup with their hands, he can stay. Anybody who kneels down to drink, send him home. And again, uh, 9,700 of his soldiers are sent home by God. And Gideon turns around, and what a motley crew it would have been. He's left with 300 Israelite soldiers to take on, I haven't done the maths on what the ratio is here, but 150,000 to 300. What is very telling is that in the scripture we are told that God, spirit, clothed Gideon. This is the power of Gideon's strength and not the number of his army. 
What then uh, happens, again, uh, in verse 9 of chapter 7, and you can go and look at all the details later, but in verse 9 of chapter 7, God says, Gideon, I will give them into your hand. Right? Midian, uh, Midian is this 150,000 uh, 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 army force down in the valley and Gideon is up in the trees and the mountains and he's looking down and God says to him from heaven, I will give them into your hand. But if you doubt, you can go down with your uh, servant and listen to one of the, and then before God even finishes the sentence, probably Gideon's legging it down the hill. I do doubt, I want to I have one last confirmation before battle. So he goes down and he listens to some dream interpreted by one of the foot soldiers down there. And basically they're saying, surely God has given our entire army into the hand of Gideon. Isn't it shameful that now Gideon hears that, he's excited, he's clicking his heels, he runs back home. Isn't it shameful, this is you and me, in Gideon, but let's just see ourselves in, in Gideon's heart at the moment. Gideon hears the voice of his enemy as more authoritative than the voice of God. God said, I will give them to you. And he says, I'm not sure. He hears a foot soldier interpreting another friend's dream in the enemy camp saying, I think God's going to kill us all. And Gideon says, finally, a voice I can trust, I'm confident. It's another reminder of the spiritual state of the character of the tenor of Gideon. Doubting even amidst his faith, much like you and I. So God told Gideon, uh, uh, and Gideon uh, obeys down in verse uh, 19 of chapter 7. Basically, this is how they're going to beat Midian. It's the middle of the night. Gideon gives, gives all of the uh, 300 soldiers a, an oil torch that is burning, and he puts over it a jar so that it can burn but not be seen, and a large, a large jar and a trumpet underneath one arm. And they all go and they find a, a place really uh, spread out, 300 men spread out across this ridge looking down on the army of Midian, and it's dark and probably there's no fires going. The Midianites can't see anything. It's, it's a soldier's secret encampment. And at Gideon's call, the uh, Israelite men blast their trumpet. 300 tr trumpets is very loud. And that would usually represent, you know, one trumpeteer to maybe hundreds or thousands of soldiers. So you hear a large amount of trumpets in Old Testament warfare, and you would assume an enormous tribe, an army, and throng of soldiers behind it. This is the, the thinking. So uh, Gideon tells them all on his, on his call, blast the trumpet loud, throw the glass jar down on the ground, and wave around your torch. And what happens in that moment is, I guess on a human level, that would be very scary. You wake up from your sleep, you look outside because there's trumpets all around this echoing valley and what an orchestra of chaos that would have been. And they look, they hear it and they see torches all along the mountains and they hear the smash of the, of the vases and the jars and their assumption is a vast army is upon us. But then there's this additional miraculous level where all of a sudden, all of the people start um, uh, throwing their swords against one another. And we see this uh, in verse, um, uh, here in chapter 7, uh, they cried and they, they fled. And the sword of, uh, uh, in verse 22, each man turned against his comrade with the sword. The Midianites start killing each other. They assume that the, the soldiers running into them are the, are the charging Israelites and they start fighting each other so that Gideon and his 300 are just watching like an ultimate UFC WrestleMania kind of deal. Uh, maybe like gladiators in the Colosseum. They're, they're around this huge circled rim. They're just looking down in the valley as all of the Midianites, 150,000 strong, just start slaying each other. What a show. What a miracle. What a deliverance of God. And then many of them run away. And here's where we have to really cut out some of the good, good content. This is some of the best part of the story. Most of them die. A bunch of them run away. Gideon and his men chase them and kill a couple of the kings and then put their severed heads on their back and march around as they look for the rest of the army. Awesome point number one. Number two, as they're marching through Israel, there's multiple groups of Israelites who get snotty with uh, the army. One of them says, Gideon, you didn't call us to battle. He starts getting, getting short with him. He gets annoyed at him. He's a man, sleepless night, chasing in battle, killing lots of people, very hungry. He's a dude. He's not up for this. So, so he gives him some lip back. 
The other guys, he, he marches through and he says, can you give us some bread? We're exhausted. We're pursuing the enemies who are going to kill you and your children, your wives and your daughters and your sons. Do you mind supplying some food? And they said, well, have you won yet? I don't see the heads of the kings with you. I don't see the, 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 the whole army. Destroy. I'll, I'll feed you when you've won. And Gideon's response is so diplomatic. And I think we just need more of this in bureaucratic relations and political discussions these days. He said, because you have not fed us, after I have won victory, so here's his faith soaring sky high now. Uh, his faith is secure. His character, I think, is also improving. And uh, he says to these guys, his brothers, his cousins, he, the other Israelite tribes, he says, because you have not supplied food for us, after I have won the victory, there's his faith, I will come back here, I will take thorns from the desert, and I will lash you all. <laughs> all right, this is... Church discipline in the Old Testament. We are under the time of grace. This is what Gideon does. And so he chases and, uh, and then he finds another group of Israelites and says, hey, where are our brothers? He goes, ah, they're all dead. And so he, he goes off. He defeats the army and, and, and destroys them, still in their tens of thousands and only 300 Israelites. And then on his march back home, he passes each of these Israelite encampments and rebukes them. One of them, I love, I love what it says here in chapter 8, <laughs> verse 15. And he said to the men of Succoth, Behold, Zeba and Zalmana, about who you taunted me, saying, Are the hands of Zebula, uh, uh, Zeba and Zalmana already in your hand that we should give bread to you who are exhausted? How yes, stingy. Verse 16. He says, The men whom you said to me about that, uh, he took, uh, well, basically he's saying, I've killed them. Yes, they're with me. Remember when you taunted me? Ha ha. And he took the elders of the city and he took thorns of the wilderness and briars with them and taught the men of Succoth a lesson. <laughs> Stern words, maybe? No, he whipped them. He scourged them with thorns, as he told them he would. Verse 17, and then he broke down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. See, we want to draw a really sharp distinction and say, but these are the good guys. These are Israelites. No, they're not, really. They're blood Israelites, but they're still Baal Asherah worshippers. They still didn't come out to help. In fact, they made it pretty hard for God's people to fight the idolaters. They have chosen a spiritual side, and the bloodline is not going to save them. They can die with their gods and their false pagan kings. This really comes uh, to the end where there was eventually a, uh, a peace won after this battle and after the war. And what we see in chapter 8, verse 22 and onwards is something very interesting. This is sort of the, the war is over and the people come to Gideon and say, be our king, your son's our king, be a ruler over, they don't use the language of king, but they, they basically say, you know, rule over us, uh, be, our, be our leader, be our rulers. And Gideon said, no, no, the Lord is our ruler. Here again, let me introduce to you the mixed motives and the questionable heart of Gideon. He obeys. He says, I'm not going to be your king. God has not called me to that. God has not called me to be your king. But then in verse 31, he names his son, my father is king. <laughs> All right, so it's, I don't know how much to believe Gideon. He's, he's writing his own biography. He said, I told him I would not be king. Then I named my son, your father is a great king that he's, he's a conflicted guy, and we're meant to read it with some conflict. Now, here's the other thing that he does. In all of his humility, in all of his meekness uh, of saying, God has not called me to be a king, so I will not take to myself to be a king, then he basically makes himself a high priest. He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I won't be a king. I'm humble. Everybody give me your gold. Give me the crescent-shaped jewelry that you stole from the camels of the men that we killed from the east. Give me your jewelry. Like Aaron took the jewelry. I think I'm remembering the story, right? I think God blessed Aaron for making a golden calf in the desert. It's been so many generations since we read our Bibles. Let me just assume it's a good story. He tells everybody to give him his gold. They give him his gold, and he, uh, they give him their gold, and he makes a high priest's uniform out of it. The ephod, which was the chess piece, with the stones on it that represented Israel, with the dice in it that represented how they, would, how they would hear from God, they would cast lots and God would direct them. He makes that for himself. He stands it up in public, and it says here in verse, um, uh, uh, verse 27, And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Ophrah, and all Israel whored after it there, 
and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more, and the land had rest for 40 years in the days of Gideon. So again, in the story of Gideon, the constant theme is, uh, yes, but not really. Was he filled with faith? Yes, but not really. Was he righteous in his warfare? Yes, but not really. Was he pure in his motives before God? Yes, he would not be king. But he did make an idol by making himself a high priest of sorts and then put his uniform after his retired days, put his uniform in the city, in the very same city that, that he tore down the Baal worship altar and the Asherah strip pole. He tore those out and then they made a worship out of, out of one of God's pieces of uniform. It's like it's so much better than worshipping Baal and and Asheroth. But is it? Because this is not how God wanted worship. And are they even worshipping God? Or like they've done today, have the same demons where they just happen to change the mask, become the ephod, even sounds a little bit biblical. They've got some Old Testament sprinkled here now. And now the same demons are receiving worship the same way. And while Gideon lived, there was peace for 40 years. But it wasn't spiritual peace, was it? They were committing idolatry. They were whoring after it and breaking covenant with God again. But at least on one level, there was political peace and there was military peace. This is the mixed history and the mixed biography of Gideon. And I think, like myself, you can see yourself in him a lot. The tragedy is that at the end of, verse, uh, at the end of chapter 8 here, Uh, when uh, when it says that there was peace in the land for 40 years. That is the last time. We're not even halfway through. But that is the last time peace is declared over Israel in the entire book of Judges. I've been saying over and over again, it's, it's a book of cycles. They commit idolatry. God punishes them. They pray. There's revival. There's deliverance. Then they commit idolatry and they pray and there's deliverance. And, and so it goes on. But it's not actually a cycle because cycles continue one after another. It's more like a wave approaching the shore. And there was cycles and there was ups and downs, but eventually it runs out. And this is one of those moments in the book of Judges. God's extending patience and mercy to the point where he gives them widespread national peace is running out. And we would do well to take that to heart, that God's grace is magnificent. And for individuals in Christ, it is infinite. But that does not mean that his patience for our sins will not come with ever increasing consequences in life. Don't ever, like Israel, don't take God's mercy and his patience and his slowness to act. Don't take that as a toleration of your sin. We reminded ourselves God is the one who's against toleration and coexistence with other idols in your heart. Tear them down. It happened to Israel, as it may well happen to us, that the the discipline of God had to match the callousness of their hearts as they kept returning to sin. They were unfamiliar with God's law. They did not bow to God's word. His discipline had to increase in pitch and in temperature and in severity as the callousness of their heart also rose. So the questions we've been asking ourselves in the book of Judges is, what happened? What's the actual history? Because it's Ugly history, but it's biblical, real history that is good for us to know. The second question has been, how does this story sort of push forward the story of redemptive history in the Bible? We can say this briefly of this story, that Israel, after chapters 6 through 8 of Judges, is that bit closer to apostasy and that bit closer to their exile. Apostasy is when you've fallen away to the point where you cannot return. Apostasy is what, on a national scale, happened to Israel when they were exiled out of the land and graciously brought back again by God 70 years later. The story should not, we should not see as this sort of equal up and down uh, cycle, uh, good days and bad days, and then bang, God just had enough and he exploded out of nowhere and exiled them. We should really see that from the earliest days, uh, they had highs and lows, but it was eventually trending downwards into a downward spiral, which would then result in the exile. Uh, There are spikes of times in the Old Testament, 
But I think the reading of the Old Testament is that the majority of Old Testament history, they weren't acting. They were, they were unrecognizable as Old Testament, Mosaic, Jewish covenant, Sinai covenant worshipers. Most of the time, the, Isra- the prophets are coming and saying, stop worshiping false gods in our temple. Most of the time, the judges, uh, in the days of the judges, they are worshiping other gods. Very little of their time is spent faithful. And it is only under a few anointed leaders. That is the tragedy of the Old Testament. There is very little spiritual or ceremonial uh, obedience at this day, at this time in uh, the Old Testament history. And they are now, uh, uh, basically, the desperation is getting worse. They are that bit closer to the exile, which will come, despite the kings that God gives them, which don't actually seem to help them all that much. They are waiting, in other words. Judges 6 through 8 has driven the nail even deeper that Israel needs to wait for one who would lead them into faithfulness and then preserve them as such. And that would come in Jesus Christ. A third question as we look at the story is, how does this story shadow or point to Jesus Christ, our Savior? And of course, as we look at Gideon, uh, just like Gideon's way, his salvation, uh, as he marched through the wilderness and, and called an army to himself, though he had a small one by the end of it, and he who warred with the demon gods, uh, he, was, he had his way prepared by a prophet, didn't he? Calling in the wilderness and preaching. And much in the same way, Jesus also had John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist came and prepared the way for Jesus. Jesus is the greater Jerubbabel. Let Satan, Lord of the flies, Baal, and all demons war with him. And they tried and they lost. And Christ crushed their heads beneath his feet. He triumphed over them on the cross. He gloried in shaming them and putting them into disrepute, destroying their reputation and unshackling their powers over human souls. Jesus did that in his perfect life and in the cross and in his resurrection. That's the power of Jesus. Let they all contend with him and he lost. But before he came also, his cousin, John the Baptist, was the preacher preparing the way. Israel, why is Rome Rome over us? Why are we under God's judgment? Why are we? Because we haven't prepared the way. We have not humbled ourselves. We have not uh, uh, excluded ourselves unto God. We have not heard his word and believed it. Therefore, repent, John the Baptist said. Repent and prepare the way for the Lord. And then the Lord Jesus marched on the scene with his tiny army of 12 men to preach the gospel to Israel and through them the world. Well, how can we find obedience for ourselves in this day? This is our, our sort of closing question that we ask ourselves. Is that, That's what happened. Uh, that's the story of the Bible. That's how it reminds us of Jesus. But what about today? What do we do today? How do we obey? I think, first of all, the book of Judges, and even this story, especially the story, screams out to us that this world, and wherever we find ourselves, for us, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, 21st century, this world around us, and primarily the church, the bride of Christ in our nation, in our state, in our city, what Judges tells us of then is that at every moment, they needed a genuine move of God to rescue them. Even politically, they, God, God was the only one who could rescue them. They were so far outnumbered. But even as we look with a spiritual lens underneath the story, even when there was peace under Gideon, there was spiritual idolatry and whoring after the ephod, we, we look back and say, they're going to fail. And no surprise, by the next chapter, they're an evil, evil acts and idolatry again because they already were under Gideon's leadership. If we look back with spiritual lenses, we can see even in the time of peace, they needed a genuine move of God, not just to rescue them externally and politically and militarily. They needed regeneration. They needed to be born again. They needed fire from on high to fall down and revive their zeal and their faith and their belief in God and a love of his word. And every Christian needs to conclude that we also have the continual need, absolute necessity for a revival of God lest we perish. 
The church in Australia and many of its denominations specifically are this tale of woe where there has been a great work maybe in the past back in England and then we exported religion here and within a generation the churches, though government funded, are empty and dead. Other people had great moves of God in this age, in this world, in this country, in this land. But within a few generations, they were degraded. They lived on the memory of, of, of who it was that belonged to their denominational history. They remember whose plaques are on their church walls. They have beautiful stone buildings all over our country and our nation. And they are now things like caravan sales shops. They are, some of them, strip malls, Airbnbs, and pubs. Why? Because the church stands not in need of just remembering the works of God. The church always and ever stands in absolute dire need of being visited by a work of God. We always, every generation, every year, must be hungry that God would give us the chief and most wonderful blessing of souls swept into the kingdom and the church awakened and putting on strength. That needs to be our absolute highest blessing that we are seeking because like Israel in Gideon's day, they would, they would compromise with the world and with the pagans and with the demons because there was some other blessing. This is the root of all idolatry. There was some other blessing they were seeking beyond the presence of God in their midst. They, they wanted agricultural blessing and Baal had that. They wanted something and so they compromised with the world around them because there was a blessing that was more rich to them than the covenant promises of God in Scripture who would win the day and bring victory for them. And the church is very similar. The only reason, Leonard Ravenhill used to equip this, the only reason we don't have revival is because we're perfectly happy to live without it. The only reason we don't have it. Too many of us are not willing to upset the status quo, and I know it's an idol, I know it's horrible, I know it's Baal, I know it's a, 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 a Asherah, I know, but, but that's what the people want, and, and I mean, it's a historical thing, and you know, it's, a, it's quite a embedded in this culture, and do we really want to topple that? Do I really want to make my neighbors angry? Yep. They oppose God, let him be angry for a moment till you pray him into the kingdom. We only don't have revival because we're, like the Israelites, just so willing to look around us and say, where's God? What's he been doing? What's he up to? We're so great, us Christians. Aren't we just so faithful with our money and our giving and our attendance and our reading and our evangelism? Aren't we just doing great? And he's just so slow, isn't he? This God we, we uh, supposedly serve. God's word rebukes us and reminds us, we are the problem. The reason our nation is not thoroughly evangelized, because of us. The reason our world is not evangelized and churches planted in every city 70 times over with the money and the human resources that the church has globally is because we choose not to do it. There is something else in our life that the demons around us, that Satan is still cackling, that he is keeping us tame, keeping us idle, keeping us satisfied, not willing to topple the status quo. Every age needs revival and the church is God's agent to bring it. Here then is a related second point of application. As we saw with Gideon, and as we saw with the very unlikely methods of winning the war, which was through jars and torches and trumpets, so also God's means for bringing revival or kingdom growth, we might call it, God's means for growing his kingdom and expanding his kingdom, or for how we ought to do spiritual warfare, which is the Great Commission, is through unlikely people and unlikely means. Unlikely people, you and I, and unlikely methods. The preaching of the gospel, the gathering together for prayer, the speaking of God's word. We are not to trust in flesh or human resources or particular people to accomplish God's mission and promises. As Gideon showed us, the only time as the book of Judges told us, the only time Israel was strong was when she had faith in God's very unlikely promises. The only time the church ever sees victory, ever sees evangelism take root and bear fruit, the only time the church has ever seen revival come is when she abandons every, pit, every bit of self-reliance and every bit of confidence on human measures and denominations and budgeting and just banks with outright faith on the promises of God 
and therefore steers directly upstream according to the means that God has given to us. Preaching the gospel, praying, church, ordinary means of grace. Unlikely means and unlikely people. Faith is what will conquer the world for Jesus Christ. As John said, faith is that which conquers the world. Faith in God and faithfulness in our task that he has given us is the only thing that will see the Great Commission go forwards. In funding our building, in winning souls, in raising up ministers, in planting new churches, in sending out missionaries to far distant lands. Faith in the promises despite the size of the enemy. Let's close again on 2 Corinthians 12. God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. Amen? You're going to boast today of being a little bit more like Gideon than you came in here thinking you are? We will boast in our weakness as long as that weakness is, is joined with faith. The reason he can boast is because he has faith in God. I will boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me just as the Spirit of God clothed Gideon. For the sake of Christ then, I am consent with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let the church of Christ thus say, when I am weak and aware of my weakness, then I am strong because it is God who is acting in that moment. Weak people and strange means is how God builds his kingdom. The gospel, the preached gospel, the prayed about gospel, the gospel proclaimed is God's power to salvation for lost souls. And that is the task of the church. That's the church's job. If you're not a believer, then your job right now is to trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for sinners like you and me. He rose victorious from the grave as the only perfect man. And now the God man seated for us in heaven, calling us home. He's going to come back one day and it will be a day of judgment, of fire and of throwing enemies into hell. But now is the day of grace and his power. So believe upon him and be saved. And Christians, we have work to do. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the word about Gideon that we, we would shake, Lord God, I do. I would quiver to think of what my biography might look like if you were to write it, how honest it would be, how, how stark it would be of any real uh, things to boast of. You would, you would highlight, and rightly so, everything I have to offer, which is just weakness. Father God, we thank you for the example of Gideon that encourages us, that if we have nothing but weakness to offer, then we have just the precise thing that you love to use to show off your strength. Lord God, I pray that you would as the prophet who came to Israel, that you would do to our hearts right now, that you would first remind us that we are more a cause of the problem than we realize. We have nothing to blame you for. We have no slowness to charge to you. We have no faithlessness to the covenant to to put against you. We are the problem, Lord God. But thank you that you have only ever dealt with problem people. We trust ourselves to you. We, We trust the promises and ask that you would deepen our faith bankrupt our self-hope and self-reliance and destroy and pull down the altars of our compromise with the demonic gods around us. Lord God, make us a beacon of light. Make us a trumpet on a hillside. Make us a flaming torch in the middle of the night to proclaim and scream over our enemies, I am not like you. I am with God and you must repent and believe in Jesus. Lord God, please stir up your church. Give us what we need in order to serve you rightly and faithfully. And would you save tonight souls who are far from you and souls who are your enemies, that they might believe and be converted. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.